you know, you're not yourself. You're not yourself. You're very calm. Yeah. Okay, everyone, welcome. Welcome back to episode number three. Number three. That's like a that's like a mini milestone of sorts for product champs, our weekly hangout with dudes who like to talk about product and life and careers. Uh, let's do quick intros. We'll recap last week. We'll jump into some hot topics for this week. So I'm DZ. I'm a PM at LinkedIn. I'm Avi. I'm a PM at YouTube. I'm not a PM. Oh, oh, sorry. No, okay. go. You're doing so well. Not interrupting. We didn't plan yeah. this. <laughs> Uh, my my name is Ahmad. I'm a PM at a firm. Uh, Samir, tell us where you're working this week. I'm Samir. I'm a PM at Pinterest. Thank you guys. Oh, still. For... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, amazing. Started. Two weeks in a row. It's a record. Uh, yeah. Hey, so wow. funny, funny, quick, funny story. Quick, very, very short, funny story. So, Ahmad, Ahmad Ishmael, 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 right? It's, Ishmael? it's yeah. I mean. It, so the, um, you know, I grew up in America, so it, it's Ismail. And then uh, Ismail. the correct way to Ahmed, say it in Arabic Ismail. is, is Ismail. Where is this is going, by Ismail. the way? No, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also I'll confused. You. I'll tell you real quick. So there was a six month period, might have been nine months. There's there a pretty long period of time where it was three um, months. I know exactly months. what you're going to say. Five, three yeah, yeah. months. Okay. So there's a three month period where Ahmad tried to get everyone that he worked with, myself included, to call him AI. Right, I did it. By the way, I fulfilled that. Yeah, design. I got it. Right. I, we try to make yeah. it a thing. Nobody else did it. Zero other people no, um, did it. Yeah. That's very yeah. dirty, man. Yeah. yeah, it was terrible. Well, well, you know, I just, uh, you know, I wanted, uh, I wanted something like DZ. You know, I was trying That's to true. follow in DZ's footsteps. AI, I guess, doesn't click as well. You tried. That that was all that, that was. That's all that matters at the end. Okay, guys, jumping back to the program. So, quick recap of the last week. Last week, we covered two topics, first being what is product or, or short for what is product management. We concluded that product is about bringing something to life, making something successful. And as part of that, finding the right problem or finding a good problem at the very least to solve. Uh, we also covered another topic, which is how do you prioritize between what the product needs, what the team needs and what you need. And I, I've actually been thinking about our conversation from last week. Basically, I think what we concluded was you're kind of screwed anytime those three things are not in alignment, right? Anytime you're prioritizing one of those above the other two, something is going wrong um, or, or you're in for a tough conversation. Um, and so, you know, I think Avi said it best. Avi said, basically, there is no answer. The only answer here is just to be aware, just to be aware that those three things can be in conflict and then live with that conflict. So great topics. Um, I encourage folks to go check out our last pod. For this week, we wanted to carry on the conversation from last week. Remember, last week's conversation was what is product management, at the end of which we concluded product is ultimately about finding good problems to solve, right? Find the right problem to solve, find good problems to solve. Nothing else matters, frankly, if you find or, or decide to work on a bad problem, like your product cannot overcome your problem. So which brings us to a logical, obvious question, which is, okay, how do you find a good problem? Uh, what is that journey like? You know, what are some reliable ways? I, by the way, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure as we go into this, there's again, no simple answer. If there were, we'd be all much wealthier at this point. Uh, but like, what are some reliable ways to shift through ideas what are some signs of bad problems? I, I think there's some smells that you know bad problems often have. Um, what is the relationship between you and the problem, right? So I, I think we should talk about the fact that all of us, you know, the four of us included, we're not suited for all problems. So like, there's like a specific set of problems that we're best for, um, and we should figure that out over time and, and go after them. So the question of the day is how to find, how do you, how should you, how can you? find a good problem. Let's start open and then we'll kind of zoom in a little bit. AI. Where to start? AI. Yeah, AI. AI. <laughs> AI, come on. Uh, you know, I don't I don't know if Bring us I in. don't know if I um or look, look, if you don't have a specific answer, just tell us how, how you. Like how do you how do you personally evaluate you know, you're thinking through all these ideas for whatever you're working on at the time. How do you evaluate? Oh, that's a that's a good idea. Oh, that's a shitty idea. Like 
that's a good problem. Oh, that's a crappy problem. Like what's the, what's the kind of rubric you have in your head? Yeah. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I'll, you know, I'll get real for a second. Um, I, uh, I grew up my life with ADD. And so one of the things that I've always done is it's been harder for me to always to like, it's harder for me to do things. Like, you know, whenever I look at a screen, for example, I don't actually, it's hard for me to actually read the copy. I just navigate towards the button that makes the most sense. Like sometimes I'll click around and I'll be like, oh, I didn't read that correctly. And I have to go back. Um, and as a result, like one of the rubrics that I use is I just put myself in. And by the way, this is the answer to my first question is like, who's the user, right? Like is the user a, someone who's trying to, you know, someone who's working nine to five doing a particular job or is the user an everyday consumer? But the rubric I go with is I put myself in the user's shoes and I like to imagine the worst possible circumstances for that user. So I'll give you guys an example. Um, uh, at media planning, for example, right? You know, um, the, sh the worst possible example I used to imagine would be, you know, it's 3 p.m. on a Friday and you get an email from your boss saying, hey, I need something before you leave. Um, and, you know, I'd re-picture that stress and put myself just like into the user's shoes. I'd imagine what that scenario is like. And I would use that as a sort of a framing for what is my immediate problem and does the thing that we've built solve that problem? Um, and the job before that, you know, I was building um, voice experiences for the TV. So you'd pick up your remote and you'd be like, you know, show me comedy movies or whatever. And the worst case scenario that I used to paint is the, um, uh, you know, you've worked 12 hours, you come home, you pick up food because you're too tired and you sit down in front of the TV and, and you know, my ADD brain would be mad anytime like a pop-up would come up, right? It's just like, I say something, just get me to the thing that I said and anything that doesn't feel like it. I mean, you guys have probably felt this where like you ask Google home or Alexa something and it's just completely off base and it can be frustrating depending on the type of mood that you're in. Um, so anyway, those are sort of the rubrics that I have. It's, it's just like a deep user empathy. I ask myself, in this particular circumstance, what is my most immediate big problem? And does solving that problem actually create some sort of value for me to where I would actually pay for it or go out of my way to download or install it? Those are sort of like the basic frameworks that I have. I, you know, I think the common, I mean, I'm, what I'm hearing you describe this, I think a common, uh, something common between those two scenarios, right? Me, like you could not name, by the way, two more different problems, right? One is like a media planner getting yelled at by their boss and one is like a mod's tired after a day of work right like those are but like i think the the common thread a mod ai rather and what you're describing is for both of those users in that moment it was very urgent you know it wasn't like hey um yeah it'd be nice if i found a movie but i'd be fine without it right or it wasn't like hey um you know, it'd be good to like knock out this media plan, but like, yeah, I could wait till next week, right? Like for both of them it was like, in that moment, it felt like, I, excuse me, I got to figure this out right now, you know? So there's a real kind of like necessity to that feeling for that, for that user. Okay, I love it. So, so some, some sense of urgency, like you, you're finding, you're almost like finding people in situations where they're a little bit desperate. They're, they're, you know, maybe not truly desperate. I mean, in neither case are these people going to, you know, lose it. But like they're, they, they, in that moment, that person feels a bit desperate, a bit trapped. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> I'd say, you know, just to add on, I'd say like, um, the thing I do is I look for emotion, right? Like something that evokes emotion, right? Like, you know, a big problem in TV is there's so much content. It's hard to watch, right? Like, I don't know if y'all have sat down and like tried to find content. You spend like 30 minutes looking for content or more time looking for content than the time you actually watch the content. And so I would really hone in on that level, like those key levels of frustration whenever I'm figuring out a problem. Um, because where there's emotion, either frustration, urgency, stress, there's usually a problem that a consumer will, or a user will come out and find you um, as a yeah. result of it. Big, big plus one. I, I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Okay, let's, let's hear, like, uh, it looks like Grandmaster is writing a dissertation of some sort. Yeah, Gandalf the Grey. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I was gonna show a slide later on, like a visual. Oh, okay, okay. Keep writing your slide. Keep writing. Yeah, your yeah, slide. I'm gonna do. I, I lost it. I'll give you some time. All right. So thank you. I will. 
I will say that I'll call mine the, the spreadsheet approach. I look for spreadsheets. And so I look for ways that users are hacking their way around problems that they have. And I think that's the one of the greatest signs that they have a painful problem. So if they've taken the time to actually try to figure out a solution to a problem they're having, that's gold to me, right? That That's the sign of a real problem that's like they've tried to solve that I can probably help them solve better than they've solved themselves. Um, but I'd say the general approach is I like talking to users, which is sometimes extremely difficult in a product role, depending on how many users you have, especially in products with fewer users as we've all worked on. It's really costly to talk to users and to get their time. Um, on products with larger user bases, um, it's much easier. And you know, I think I like having conversations, not necessarily asking users what exactly their problems are, but just talking about their general workflows and seeing if there are any solutions they've come up with themselves, um, where they're spending the most time, just really having like ongoing conversations, not just when I first start working on the product, but throughout bringing back solutions that I, I think might work for them and working through those. I'll also point out that I think the wrong way to do this that a lot of people mistake for a problem is they find a solution looking for a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so this happened to me often when I was working in research and development, which was, you know, there's a very cool technology, something really interesting. And you almost went about this backwards, which is we have a really cool solution. What are problems we could go solve? And I discovered that was almost always the wrong way to go about this. If you start there, you will fail almost every time. There, there are some really subtle ideas here. I mean, I just want to pick up a few things you said, Avi, and then, and then riff on them, and then buy Grandmaster Samir some more time to write his <laughs> slide. I, I'm, so, I'm good. It's done. It's you're good? Done. You got the slide. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, there's there's a couple. So, so your idea, so one of your ideas here is hacking, you know, if, if the, if the, um, if the person you're talking to has hacked their way through this, right? They've stitched together like an Excel spreadsheet and maybe they have some sort of uh, Zapier thing, you know, if they're technical, you know, some sort of Zapier thing, but you're like, oh, this person cares enough to go try to build this, right? Uh, we're yeah. onto something here. Um, I love that approach, by the way. And, and the one thing I want to mention here, back to my earlier comment about person product fit or person problem fit, is that like in my own career, all of the products that I've shipped that have been successful, the first version is basically a spreadsheet, right? The, the UX team, by the way, hates this, right? So I'm basically like, hey, you know, like I could take this, dump into a spreadsheet, email it to all these people, and they'd be like 80% satisfied, right? If we build out all this other stuff on top, you, we'll get to 95. But it was really that spreadsheet with the, you know, it's, so, so all of my my expertise or my, you know, where I gravitate towards have been sort of data products. You know, the data is the juice you package with the data and, and, and do it. And so um, it just triggered that memory in me that like, um, for me, a good signal that I'm in a right space for myself is whether the first version could be a spreadsheet. And if it, if, if that's true, then, you know, usually that means I'm a, I'm a do, you know, I'm, I'm a person to do better in that problem space than others. The other thing I, 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 I just want to, up, oh, I want to add one more thing. And I think depending on the product you're working on, the spreadsheet thing can manifest in different ways, right? Okay. So if you're working on a consumer facing product, it might not be a spreadsheet, but users might've found a different way to hack uh, their solution into the product. So, you know, looking for hacks in general, but I'd say in a lot of spaces, it manifests as a spreadsheet. You, know, you like, like reusing a group's product or using a messaging, uh, like. I mean, can I, can I, can I, I can, uh, I can yeah, actually. No, Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh yeah. Look at I was going to answer. I was right? going to answer Avi's question for you, DZ, okay. and even a consumer product, by the way. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm an escape room enthusiast. Um, I do a lot of escape rooms, and um, one big problem with most Yelp reviews or Google Maps reviews is is anybody who does an escape room for the first time is going to rate that escape room very highly. But someone who does, you know, 100 plus escape rooms, like the, the community I'm in. Um, it's, you know, they may not rate that as like a five stars. They may rate it as like three stars. And so there's literally a community-based spreadsheet, like a California-based spreadsheet where people are, you know, all in California, you know, I can send you guys this link, are going in and literally posting reviews for these like escape room enthusiasts. And so they've actually, you know, found a roundabout way, which is like just create a spreadsheet that's public to everybody to, to, to sort of meet this use case. And that's like, that's a real, you know, problem that uh that that exists because they found this random way to do it yeah i think avi you're saying something very important which is 
a spreadsheet is a way that uh, people are solving the problem. But what you're really saying is people go through pain to actually solve this problem. Like exactly. the existing tools don't work and they are taking on undue pain with, you know, tools that aren't naturally suited for it, but kind of do the job. I think that's a really good indication. It's a good problem because one of the things I wanted to talk about later was, you know, the difference between like a vitamin and a painkiller problem. Uh, and often ones where, you know, people are using a spreadsheet. Well, it's probably causing them a lot of pain. Um, that's why they're resorting to spreadsheets or some other tool that wasn't meant for it. And that's a really good sign. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that. Uh, talk, talk about that for a sec, Samir. I mean, like, let's stay on that. It's like, yeah, is where you're going. Cause you brought this vitamin pain. Uh, you, we, you know, the four of us talked about this. You brought this up a few times is the takeaway yeah. here that you're trying to get at that you should almost never solve vitamins. Like maybe you solve vitamins because they're adjacent to a pain and yeah. you, you know you accidentally yeah. solve the vitamin problem but yeah, like, yeah, yeah. if you're solving vitamin problems as the core product thesis stop immediately is so, that what we're trying to get at right so so just for definitions of a vitamin painkiller distinction here is um you know a painkiller is something that is such a, a, a is a solution to a, a real burning pain for the user right like this customer, this user has this real problem that they're suffering through and they want nothing more than your product to solve that problem. They're going to jump at, you know, they're going to walk over broken glass to find this solution and they're going to, they're going to use it. Even if that solution is a spreadsheet and then they're really going to want something better. A, a, um, a vitamin is something that like is nice to have. It's good to have your vitamins. You get, you know, you feel better. Uh, but if you don't use it, if you don't take it for a month, a year, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to kill you. So um, th that's the the high level distinction. Uh, DZ, you make a good point. In general, m I gravitate towards painkiller problems, but I don't think it's a universal rule because if you look at a lot of like very successful consumer apps, um, it's it's hard for me. And there probably is a painkiller thesis behind some of those, but I haven't been able to find them. And, but they're super successful. So I think for, I personally gravitate towards, you know, painkiller problems. Although I look at Snapchat and say, like, actually there probably is the, a painkiller there. Yeah, like probably, I don't probably, want my stuff hanging out. Right? Yeah. yeah. Snapchat, Ahmad yeah. being, be, the kids yeah, Ahmad, may be able to explain tell us, this. Yeah, Ahmad, yeah, tell us what is kids, the pain yeah, behind <laughs> stuff? What was the pain that TikTok is trying to solve? Right. Wow, okay. All right. For, I'll, let me explain something about the the kids these and days. And also, why don't you why don't you just uh, you. also give everyone your uh, TikTok handle or whatever it is so we can follow <laughs> that's you. That's right. On. That's right. <laughs> we'll follow your antics. Tell us. I mean, no, I, I think this is a real question. I, I think there's legitimate, you know, yeah, a, a yeah. legitimate need here. We, you, and I can't articulate it, but a mod probably can. Right. 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 Okay. So, uh, all right. So, so to okay. So a couple of things. First, to get off the gray. Um, with, I think, I think a better example of a, of something that is a vitamin consumer app that I think is articulated to be a painkiller is like mint or any of those like financing apps. Cause I don't think it actually, yeah. I don't yeah. think it actually changes your habit, right. Which is like the painkiller, right? Like you're bad at yeah. saving. You yeah. need something to change your habit. Yeah. And all this does is tell you, you know, retrospective view, like it, it's right. a vitamin attempted to being a, a painkiller yeah. now to, to answer the you know the TikTok Snapchat thing, I think um, they're they're different, and I think Snapchat Snapchat's painkiller, so to speak, is um, yeah. I think Snapchat has a philosophy of of staying in, you know it's opposite of Facebook and Instagram in the sense that you're trying to stay in touch with very close friends. So the same way that we have this like weekly conversation, yeah. and that connects us. What Snapchat is trying to do is for the younger population is you know keep keep these close tabs like keep daily check-ins on you know that small right. niche groups of friends which is why they do things like um i think i don't know if they still do this uh, but they used to have streaks right and so you'd yeah. see screenshots of people like 900 snap you know streaks yeah. you know like 900 days of consecutive snapchatting each other which means that those two people had 900 you know, consecutive days of checking in with each other, seeing what the other person is doing, you know, and that's how they stay close. That's how they, you know, so I think that is the painkiller that Snapchat solves. Mm. Yeah. I mean, do you want me to stop there before? No, I, no, no. I, by the way, I don't no, think no, this is right. This is just my opinion. Yeah. No, no. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say. I, I agree with you. That's the problem they're solving. It's in my mind, 
debatable whether that's a painkiller or a really good vitamin, right? I mean, I think that's like uh, maybe it doesn't uh, matter at that level. But like, I, I yeah, now yeah, that Ahmad yeah. describes it, right? Like, yeah. if someone said to you, "Hey, I really want to stay close to my high school buddies," like. That feels very similar similar to like what you describe as pain, right? Like, like it's the inverse of pain. Like it brings such joy and happiness, you know, that, that when yeah. you do it, um, yeah. you feel really rewarded. Right. Ahmad, is there a similar, is there a similar kind of TLDR pain for TikTok? I, I imagine it's very different than that, but like, is there a similar one? I think, I think TikTok's different. And I think the way that it's different is that um, from, so there's the creator view and then there's the like viewer view. Um, and the viewer view is that I want really funny, shorthanded content. Um, and, you know, I don't think that, you know, I think Instagram has versions of this if you subscribe to the right accounts. But the thing that I've realized, like, I don't, by the way, I don't have a TikTok account. I just watch things through my fiance's account. You know, she, she, she shows them to me. Whatever. Uh, yeah. uh, but, but something I've learned is that I don't have any original thoughts. That's the thing I learned on TikTok is like- We, there's we a learned lot of... that a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> no, but I mean, even, even like some of the comedic things that, you know, like the jokes you say to your friends, like all that stuff is on uh, on TikTok. And I think uh. the, the, the painkiller that, that TikTok truly solved is making it easy for any average human being to create premium content, right? This is what YouTube, I think used to do, which is like anybody with a camera can like post something that is creative and be viewed and i think youtube has now changed into like premium you know branded kind stuff. Of, yeah premium branded stuff right like the people the content you see there is like they've got teams of people helping them not not quite hollywood status but like and now what tiktok has solved is like you literally pick up your phone and it's like in five minutes you have a funny creative video that could be trending by millions and billions of people um so i think that's the painkiller it solved it's more on the creator side and as a result it has this you know I, you know, look, like, it sounds silly. I mean, maybe it sounds silly, but like the pain of I have five minutes. I really want something very entertaining. Right back to your like mm -hmm. problem with the, the media set top box, right? I, I literally have five minutes. I want something so entertaining that's going to take me away from whatever I'm doing for five minutes. Yeah. I don't want to go through Instagram and find the right person or whatever. I just want to open up TikTok. Like that's, that's uh, like billions of people have that problem, right? As as attested yeah. by how yeah. viral TikTok is, right? That's and that right. problem happens like forty times a day. So, by the way, DZ, what you just said is a great segue to my my graphic. Um, uh, Graphicus, Graphicus, are you, are you okay. present? Oh, our am, first product champs press. Oh my God, it's a real slide. <laughs> you, okay, you well, as you, as as you can see, in fashion, it's just three bullet points. That's right. <laughs> I Very that format. Easy. You know, that's, yeah. why, that's uh, why I know this is a good slide, by the way. The, the, the reason I know this is good is because it looks so crappy that the content okay. must be good, right? right. If uh, the wait, slide wait, is well wait, formatted, I'm very disgusting. Yeah. The click um, to add to title is still on the screen. That's right. That's right. Okay. Tell us. Tell um, us. Yeah. So, no, basically, I, I think you touched on it, DZ, which is, when I think about a problem, I think about three aspects to it. Um, the first is, you know, how many people have this problem? And, and that was your thing, which is like, you know, a billion people have this problem of like, I want to be entertained. The second one is how often they have this problem. And that's like, you know, if you look at very popular consumer apps or even like just your phone, you'll realize that people crave these things or have this problem like multiple times a day, right? Yeah. And then the third one is, like how, 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 how much better do you make it for that user every time they experience this problem and solve it with your, with your solution? So how much value can you add each time? And the, you know, the way I used to think about it, I used to, I used to draw um, this little graph on the whiteboard. And, and there's a couple of interesting things, right? The first is uh, if you look at the x-axis, there's coverage. And it really just, you should think about it as like one person or the world is the extremes, right? Like yep. sometimes that one person is your exec and they're telling you to solve a problem that only they have. Uh, sometimes it's, it's yourself. Um, and then on the other end, it's the world. And then there's frequency, which is this problem only occurs once. That, by the way, that's a per user frequency. Mm. Um, you know, it happens once for the user. Uh, and you can think about like, you know, not once, but like low frequency items for a user 
getting married, buying a car, buying a home. These are like low frequency problems or low frequency problems. Yeah, per user. And then there's every day, uh, or you can even take it to every, you know, 15 minutes if you think about the, the, the mobile sort of social apps of the world. But that's the per user frequency. And then the, the bubble is supposed to indicate how much value you add each time you solve it. And so really the, the, the answer to how like valuable this is, is the product of all three. But the insight here is that actually, you know, people tend to think a lot of people have to have the problem. They've got to have it very often. And by the way, that's, I think at Google, we used to call those toothbrush problems, right? Like, hmm. um, you know, everyone brushes their teeth. They brush it every day. That's like a really high frequency. Um, but then there's also this other type of problem, like the password reset problem that mm -hmm. like a lot of people got this problem. Not everyone loses their password. A lot of people lose their password. They certainly don't lose it every day, except for me. Uh, but you know, they lose it like at, at a low frequency, but in that case, the value you can add each time you help them successfully reset their password is epic. So that's sort of the interplay between these three variables and how I like to look at this. Graph. This, this chart's great. I mean, one, one of the things, by the way, to me, that's great about this chart is actually you can defend starting in any quadrant. Uh, yeah. I, I think actually the mistake that most people make when they think about yeah. it this way is they start upper right. Uh, right. Actually, that brush circle is tiny, right? The, the, the value exactly. add of a better toothbrush is like negligible, right? Like everyone has it, like six billion people. But like, yeah. are you, you know, unless it's a robot, even a robot, like you still got to stand over, stand over, you know, two minutes, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I think once you know, once you have these concepts in your head, you can start lower right in your exploration, but look for a big pain. I, I think that's what kind of where we're netting out. It's like, hey, starting up a right is really tricky. You can start lower right, but the circle has to be massive. Like you're literally yeah. on fire. You're going to die tomorrow. Right. right, or you can get fired, right? In the in the right. enterprise context. By yeah. um, the way, I'd, and I'd, and that might be a better starting point. <clears throat> I'd argue, I'd argue with you, DZ, that I actually I think a better place to start is top left. Okay. Uh, and um, find areas to where solving that problem actually there's anecdotal problems that actually bring you to more and more users. I I personally my view is I'd rather solve a high frequency uh problem for a thousand users than solve a once a year problem for a million users well um, i like ho home buying right is a good counter example you know like like look I, again i'm saying like by having this matrix you can actually think about yes what are the trade-offs between I, starting absolutely I, <clears throat> I think the discussion you guys are having is exactly the kind of discussions that have come up when i've done this before and, and there's no right answer also, it depends on the business model. Like if you think about mm. the business model for problems that get solved at different quadrants here, it's very different. Um, you're not going to have a subscription business off of something that has a low frequency user, right? You're going to have a subscription business off of something that a lot of people want. They want it semi-regularly. Um, that's why you see like homes are commission driven because that's the opportunity to, for the person mm. solving the problem, like your realtor, to capture value out of that transaction. That transaction isn't happening very often. So, so I think actually, you know, consumer versus enterprise tends to start at different points. Yep. Um, you know, like V ones versus V zeros versus V threes start at different points uh, of problems. <clears throat> and then I think also the business model depends um on on where you are so there's a lot that you can do i encourage people just to like plop this on the whiteboard and like start thinking about it not just in terms of like problems but also use cases for your product like which use cases fall where i think i think you'll learn a lot love it hey let's stick with this graphic one sec because i, I want to give my answer so what i've heard so far yeah. is urgency and emotion i've heard looking for people who are hacking a problem i've heard this kind of matrix of multiplying these three things together and looking for you know the biggest combinatorics um, so my answer is a little different actually than all three of these, which is great, um, which is I often think about, and I often go looking for problems that are very durable and very hard to satiate. Like they're going to last forever. Like, you know, there's a problem this is never going away. And no matter how much you deliver, the person wants more, right? So the best example I have of this is the Bezos um, Amazon trifecta, right? So I, I can't remember which, you know, which earnings report or which annual letter he wrote this in. But he basically said, hey, I don't know that much. <laughs> you know, he's a humble guy at, the, at this time. I don't know that much, but I do know that our customers will want more selection, faster delivery, 
and cheaper prices indefinitely, right? Like, like no matter no matter what else changes, like the world could up. This is pre-mobile, right? This is like probably, you know, um, you know, mid '90s yeah. when he said this, right? This is pre-mobile. This is pre. This is pre. Like so many things happened, and his observation was totally correct. Like no matter what else happened in the world, we could bring all of China and India online, right? Doesn't matter. Those three things are going to be durable. Cheaper prices, more selection, faster delivery. And I think that idea actually applies to a lot of product areas, even in enterprise, where you can be like, hey, is there a ceiling on this need? Like, if I give you 10 times more of whatever you just said, are you done? Or you're like, fantastic, even more, right? Up to the point where, like, the, the, you know, I, I wish for a thing and it materializes on my desk, right? That, that's, that's, that's the ultimate fulfillment, right? But, you know, you have a lot of room between here and there. Um, so my, my point being, I think if you think about the equivalent of those three dimensions in lots of different spaces, you, you realize there are certain problems that are both, um, you know, very durable, meaning, uh, you know, people are going to have them for a long time and they're hard to satiate. And, and the reason I think these are good problems is because I just feel like I'm not, I'm not the type of person who can pick up on that trend that's happening, you know, a very small scale. Like you know, some people are so good at picking up on these like little signals and then they go after the little signals and they become massive. I'm like, it has to be blindingly obvious and it has to be so obvious that the problem will still be here in 10 years um, and it will be just as big, right? Um, and, and that's a good problem to go after because then you don't have to worry about like waking up one day and finding out your user is pretty happy with what they got because you know, they're gonna be pretty unhappy with what they have pretty much forever. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good way to think about it, Dizzy. I like that. I, I think you could almost add it as a fourth <clears throat> dimension to Samir's graph, right? Where I think you could evaluate these problems. Oh, satiableness or something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, longevity, satiableness. Um, I, I think there are lots of different ways to, to call it, um, but it seems like definitely one of those criteria that should be added. Yeah, I, I, it's sort of like, where does the bubble move over time? Because DZ mm. durability like implies time. As like, oh, if I'm using this, it's a hot trend. I'm using this every day. Sure. I'm using this every, whatever. And like over time, fewer and fewer people use it and they use it less and less often. That's not a durable problem, especially yeah. if it's still pegged on, you know, the, the business model of whatever it was when it was hot. It's not going to be as lucrative to solve anymore. I, I, your, your time dimension of durability over time is really important. That's awesome. Oh, but also yeah. the like... I think satialness can also go, there's maybe another dimension of like, is this, does this problem remain evergreen and hard, right? Let, so let me give you right. a few examples here, which is like, I would argue most of Google's most successful products key into one specific need that is basically durable forever and never goes away, right? Like yeah. the latency between hitting enter on a Google search box and getting a response, right? That's always gonna be a hard problem the user always wants less time and better results, right? Like that, that's never going away. Like once you hone in on that problem, you have a problem for life. Same thing for Gmail, same thing for YouTube. So there's, there's, there's kind of value in these problems that um, remain problems, you know, and, and then that's coming right. in there. Um, okay, I wanna bring us back to an, another point. And by, by the way, this is a great conversation that I'm, I'm glad we're having, but there's a, there's a point that Avi brought up earlier, which I want us to dig into a little bit, which is around, um, solutions looking for problems versus thinking about the problem and then go design the solution. And obviously I never do the opposite, right? Um, such as you, you invented a way to play, say, video games in the cloud, and then you go looking for a, a problem for this solution. I, the, 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 the thing I want to pick up on and, and I must debate a little bit is there's an adjacent idea that's subtly different, but very importantly different um, that's I. That's really a really good way to do it, which is cluing into when the technology allows a different solution, right? So I'll give a quick story here. And let's dig into it. The story here is in college. Back to my college. My every week one college hey, story. Hey, Ahmad, remind everyone where he went to college again. Because <laughs> stop, stop, stop. every time so, he doesn't say, it, we got to tell him. He went to MIT. Ah, right. yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Got a computer yeah. science degree from MIT. Right, right, right we're good guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really smart guy. Of us. Yeah. 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 In college, yeah. right. this is yeah. this is uh, this is like either ninety nine or two thousand. In college, this is pre iPhone, right? Um, in college, pre iPhone, I got hired to solder the little boards that went into zip cars. Anyone remember zip car? Does it yep. do the kids know what yeah, it is? 
Okay, no. so so Zipcar was the solution to urban. <laughs> Ahmad, it's a car that doesn't drive itself. That's right. for... <laughs> Ahmad, like, what the hell is this so useless? What do you I, know? I, yeah. I, I don't know what it is. The, the joke here is like Zipcar and Uber, if you think about it, we're going after the exact same problem. They're trying to solve totally. the same problem. Yeah, except one was built, Zipcar was built pre iPhone, right? And so what did you do? You got this little card with an RFID in it, and then you built this little reader inside your car. That would read the RFID, send a signal over the very slow, you know, uh, you know, a, a connection at that point in time, and then unlock the car, right? And I, I soldered these boards. And the Zipcar, you know, as as we all know, kind of kind of went nowhere. I mean, it's, it's a it's a fine company, but it was not Uber, right? And when Uber, like Uber's timing was so precise because iPhone was just starting to take off, and now you have this like geolocation device in my pocket, and so the solution went from card reader in physical parked cars to I hail a cab and the cab shows up in five minutes, right? And, and the difference is probably a factor of, my guess is 10,000 in terms of outcome. So like noticing that the technology, I, either it was intentional or it was accidental, I have no idea, but like noticing that the technology all of a sudden enables you to go after the same problem, but with a 10,000 X better solution, that's magical, right? I, I, feel like, I feel like a lot of really successful startups basically have that same premise, which is like some technology changed. They go after the same problem that you everyone's been after for 20 years, but that's now right. the solution is radically better. And, and DC, that's a really, really good point. One of the ways that, you know, visually on our, on our graph here, if you think about it, the problem characteristics of like how often, how many people need a car and how often they need it roughly stay the same, but Uber enabled them to solve that problem so much more easier Yes. Uh, and so much more often. And the way that manifests is like, for any given problem, chances are there is a solution today. And that size of the bubble on that coverage frequency, whatever, you know, access point, there is the bubble there. And the question is, as DZ is saying, is there a technological advantage that allows you to solve that problem and make the value you add, like with a much, much bigger circle, mm -hmm. right? Like, can you add, can you 10X or more the, the the incumbent in terms of value add. I think that's a really good signal about whether you, not what makes a good problem, but whether it's worth going after that problem, yeah. uh, which is to look at like, can you make it significantly better uh, with your approach to it? And maybe that's technologically enabled. I, I think one, another important point is is to satisfy <clears throat> DC's criteria of, of longevity, or I forget what you called it, DC. Satiable, but yeah, yeah, durability. Satiableness, durability. Yeah. Um, even if you do a much better job solving this problem, the need to get from one place to another conveniently will still exist, right? Forever, so that same right? forever, right? Like yep. this, even even in a world of self-driving cars, this this problem will still exist. Um, and so I think it's interesting. It satisfied us a lot of our criteria that we've laid out. Ahmad, you're going to jump in. Uh, no, I think everything. I think that's everything that's been said is. Uh... Pretty solid. I think what I was going to ask you, DZ, was, and maybe we don't have time for this, We're but um, at, at some point, I'd love to hear your guys' perspectives about, um, do you think it's harder to find a problem when join, like joining a bigger company than a smaller company or vice versa? Because I mean, Ooh. you know, what we're saying today is like, you go join a team, go find, you know, the problem. But a lot of times... There's already things, unless you're you know, doing something truly zero to one, like there's already a bunch of stuff there. So like, how, you know, how do we make this more practical for the, uh, you know, the everyday PM joining the- Yeah, let's, new, let's, let's riff new, on this a little bit. I mean, since you asked, I'll, I'll, I'll give my very quick synopsis and then let's, let's, let's hear a little bit right up. So, so your point, I think is, I think your point is actually quite profound. So like when you're joining a large company, right? You're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. Like we were all media planning. If the four of us had decided to build a CRM, which would not have been unreasonable, uh, we one of us would have gotten fired, right? Probably, maybe. Um, so, like when, when you join a large company, you're you're not handed a blank sheet of paper. We're, we're not building flying cars, right? That that's not on the table. Uh, we are given a box, and the box is called planning for ads, right? Anything in the box goes, right? Anything you could, you could argue is inside the box is fair game, but like if we wanted to rewrite, you know, search infra layer fourteen. It's like, what are you guys doing, right? But I would, I would character, and, and of course, when you're doing a startup, by the way, you're kind of given a blank sheet of paper. I would argue, actually, when you're, given, when you're doing a startup, you're actually also 
constrained and you're constrained by what you know right you, you're, I mean you as a founder as a PM are going in the search and you can't search all the universe you have to search kind of within the parameters and so you're in a large company you're governed by the organization your box is called planning in a startup you're constrained by you right like with the universe that you can you know it's like the fog of war I can see that far in these directions um, but in, inside both boxes though I would argue that you're not really a PM if you don't have a choice over what problem to solve in that space. Like the space is given, the space was given to you, but you still, to, to Samir's point, even if you're given a product and you're deciding features, you still need to have the autonomy to choose these features add a ton of value, those features don't, let's work on X, let's kill Y, so forth. I would argue also that even in a big company, when you inherit a problem or you inherit a space, the first thing you should do is validate the problem, right? I think that one thing you might discover is that the problem that everybody thought was a hair and fire problem or, or the painkiller is not actually the painkiller problem. It's the vitamin and you might identify the right painkiller problem. So I'd say like that's step one and then kind of you go from there. It, speaking also transparently, like I, I think uh, when I joined when I joined your guys' team and the very first project I was put on, I thought it was a vitamin. I did not think it was a painkiller. You know, I was like, I don't think this is a real problem. And then when we put the product in front of users and UX research, everybody, like the res response is outstanding. Like, yes, this is amazing. Like this, like, this is great. And then it, that was like, oh, okay. Like this is a real problem. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think uh, you can have interpretations of, this might be a vitamin and then it turns out to be a painkiller or this is a painkiller and it turns out to be a vitamin. Just yeah. stick to what, what, what users actually say and what they think if you're not the user yourself. Yeah, I, I think he makes a really good point, which is validation of the problem is critical. And, you know, DZ's right, in the absence of going and talking to users or being one of the users or whatever, like you're limited by yourself, talking to users to validate, I would say both the, the problem and then later on, but much later on, you know, whether your solution is going to cut it for them um, is, a, is a critical part of picking the right problem. Um, I think for, for, you know, people joining product management teams within large companies, I think what DZ said is right, which is you have to be able to evaluate problem ideas and lead the team towards solving the right problems and building the right features. Otherwise, your job is very constrained and it's, it's, you know, it's much more of an execution uh, role, which sometimes makes sense given the phase of the product, given the phase of the, of, of the company. But in reality, if you're starting, you know, even in a large company from first principles or ground up, you want to have that freedom to pick the right problem. Uh, it really affects the course that the product's on. So, so my question was do you think do you think it's harder though so I, I think everything that you've said is true dz right is like in a startup world you're limited to the resources that you have the knowledge that you have in a big company you're given this space do you think it is harder or easier at a bigger company to find a problem this is a, this is a tough one to answer like i mean like a lot of our answers by the way like are non-answers you know because we're pms <laughs> so we give like the both answer I, I think they're harder in some ways and easier in others right like the hard the way in which it's harder is that uh you know there might not be a fit between you and the space i mean i, I kind of see this a lot actually right um and so you know if you happen to stumble on the right box or you chose the right space to play in bang up drop to you and I, I think the four of us you know have stumbled into the right spaces repeatedly in our career but you know if, if you step into the wrong space um you're going to be in a world of hurt because you're going to have a difficult time identifying problems in the space um that being said um you know one of the benefits and advantages that comes with large companies is that you're often scaffolding off of something right like even in the problem discovery phase <clears throat> having the brand of google or having the brand of Google ads as a platform or having these things makes a material difference, right? Getting access to people, having these conversations, um, you know, this is X plus Y, you know, and, and having those sort of things versus when you're doing a startup, I think, you know, A, you have the benefit is you have the choice of what space you play in. Hopefully you're sensible and you, you choose a space that's good for you. Um, but you really are starting from nothing, 
right? You know, unless you, you're, you're a serial founder with a lot of credibility, you're, you're starting from, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a blank sheet of paper. I, I think, it, I think I'll take an opinionated point on what DZ said, which is, I think it's easier in a startup to, to pick the problem. Um, and, and for no other reason than you have fewer people to convince. Um, and the incentives at a large company for what problems people want to solve is also like intermingled between, you know, career trajectory, solving the problem, technical preference, oh, blah, blah, plus blah. A thousand. And I, yeah. So I think, I think if you, if you, if you're truly talking about problem selection, um, I think one of the definitions of, of a startup that I've, that I've, you know, really latched onto is like, you're trying to find product market fit. A startup is a company that's sort of like it, it exists to find product market fit and by definition is iterating a lot. And in that iteration, you get a lot of swings that, of course, constrained by funding, by time, et cetera. But, but you get a lot of swings that, um, at which problem you want to solve and, and there is inherent flexibility there. I'll, I'll yeah, argue a, slightly different, I'll be I'll argue a slightly different point of view, which is, <clears throat> I think it depends who you are. I think that in order for what you're saying to be true, Samir, you have to be extremely disciplined as a PM. Because I think along with that lack of constraints comes the ability to pivot often and decide your problem is not important or overly weight the importance of your problem with very little accountability. Um, whereas you know, at a larger company, you have a, almost too much accountability um, and too many constraints sometimes. And I think both are a forcing factor. So I think it's important to know which style of PM you are and whether you have that discipline to like only go after the most important That's problems. Right. Yeah. And if you don't, it's probably a good idea to build that up before you go into a world without constraints. I love it. I love it. Let's do one more question love here it. and then we'll do some uh, carve out. So my last question here, and this goes back to, um, you know, recently I've started weightlifting. Uh, just I'm that age where you're supposed to, you know, we're guys, we're supposed to weightlift at a certain age. And one of the things the weightlifting videos don't tell you is how is it supposed to feel? Right? They, they all describe like, how, how does it look? Like your, your, your back must be straight and it must be this angle and so forth. And they never would get into like, I mean, I, I find that not very useful, right? Because in the moment I'm not like looking in the mirror, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like in my head. And so I wish they would just say, hey, the way it should feel is like your shoulders should be relaxed and your back should be tight or something like this, right? And so my, the reason I bring this up is because um, I think the same thing applies to a lot of our work. Right, which like you read, you know, you have Samir's diagram on the wall, uh, but then in the moment when you're talking to a user, how, how does this feel? And so let, let's just cover that for a few minutes here. I mean, does it feel like, you know, you're hunting down prey in the forest, you're like tracking the deer and you're trying to figure out the signals that tell you the deer was here. Does it feel like you're just drilling holes in the ground and you know that there's oil somewhere around here and that you just got to drill enough holes and you'll find the oil? Like what's the metaphor that, you think is most apt for how does it feel to actually go through this wilderness, this journey, and find a good problem? I, I have um, I have some thoughts here. Uh, DZ, that's a really good analogy. I I don't weight lift, but maybe I should. And thanks to you now, I, I might start. But that's a really good analogy. I think one of the things is you know, whenever you talk to users, they'll tell you their problem is important. Um, often in like UXR situations or even like, it's not just UXR, but like whenever you're talking to a user and you're sitting them down and telling them like, I'd like to talk to you about this problem. They're going to make that problem sound like the biggest pain that they need a painkiller for regardless of what it is. And that's why you, you know, you often hear this advice of like, make them pay you first before, you know, like, can you get a check for this thing before it even exists? Cause that's how, you know, it's a real problem. So this hunting down in the forest, this thing is like, it's a really good analogy because you, you're often misled by the, 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 the drama and hype of the situation where like, I'm talking to Avi about his problem. He's going to tell me it's a big problem. Of course. And then when he walks away after the interview, he's like, like goes to Starbucks, gets a cup of coffee, never thinks about the problem again. But like, as a PM, it's my job to validate that across a lot of people. And so the, the point of this is, you, it should feel like you are triangulating to the same answer across multiple different mm. techniques. Ooh, you, you, okay. you hear it, you ah. see it. And then also, you know, like 
you smell it empirically you know? it was uh, i mean empirically empirically avi is doing something that is not just talking about his problem he's mm -hmm. like posting on the forums or whatever or he's using a spreadsheet like it can't just be one signal i think that's a really uh important way to sort of like triangulate to the same answer from multiple different techniques okay i i agree with that i going back to how it feels for me it feels exciting right it's like i there's a certain excitement that comes with with thinking i have a problem that's real or a problem that's important um and, and that's honestly the part that i enjoy most about this job is like identifying those those little uh glitches in the matrix of these problems um i think one thing that i look for in addition to what samir said is consistency so i think yes you might encounter users that say their problems are important but if you encounter a bunch of users that all describe the same problem and all say it's important consistently cite the same pain points i'd say that's a pretty good signal that there's a real problem there um unless you know they've been talking to each other which is unlikely um i'd say you you probably stumbled onto something um real there and i, I think an important thing to do is to come into these chats with users with your own hypothesis and I learned this from a, a UX that I, a UX research that I've been working with recently. It's like come up with a hypothesis, and after every interview, try to validate or invalidate the hypothesis. And it's been really useful. And if you're consistently able to validate the hypothesis in a similar way, I found that's a that's a great signal of a problem. Love it. AI, tell us how, how it feels. How you feel? I think you're gonna make this stick, DZ. AI, it, it is. We're gonna try. We're gonna try real hard. You know, I felt bad for not making it the first time. I, I for appreciate not making it, it working hard enough on it. AI, let's do it. I, I'm gonna get one of these names stuck for Samir, either Grandmaster or Gandalf the Gray, or I'll, I'll think of another one. Um, so I, I think, uh, I think what it's the analogy I was gonna give is very similar to um, what Samir was saying. Uh, but to me, it's kind of like solving a puzzle or a riddle, and in the sense that, like, you're checking all your assumptions, you know, you're fact checking your assumptions. Cause like there's assumptions that are going into like, okay, I need this answer, but these are the clues I have. Let me, let me fact check them. Um, and there is this sort of like chase or like this excitement feeling of like, all right, let me figure out if I put all these clues together, can I actually, you know, solve this, you know, get the answer that I need to solve this riddle um, or, or this puzzle. Um, and it, it, it also matches like, you know, you're using different pieces or clues to, to get the answer that you need. It's not like there's no single formulation. There's no single, you know, way of approaching this because, you know, every problem has its own puzzle and its own riddle. But as long as you're going through the process of finding the clues and, you know, sort of attaching the clues, checking the assumptions in the clues, um, then, you know, you can get you can get to the answer. So like to me, like that's the way I've always thought about it. OK, that's a very cerebral answer. I'll, I'll give the opposite answer just to uh, give the counterpoint here, which is for me, this process feels very vulnerable. You know, I mean, I think you guys spoke to something early at the very beginning of this conversation, which is like, when you stumble on a problem, like the emotional state of the person you're talking to changes, you know, it's very noticeable, actually. Um, like all the, you know, you're just talking, we're just, we're just having a good time. Maybe I paid you 45 bucks to do this interview, whatever. Like, you know, it's just, it's a normal conversation. And then you stumble on something. It's almost like their eyes light up and their body, you know, their 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 composure changes. And so uh, that's you know. So my answer to the question: How does it feel? It feels very human. It feels very emotional. It feels like you to to a point. I go in the room, or Avi and Amad both say the same thing. I go in the room with a set of notes and I did some pre work and I thought about this matrix that Samir created and I have this like world view. But then once I sit down, you know. It's like a little dance of sorts, you know. Like I, I'm just sort of, I'm just trying to clue into this person. Where are they going? Uh, what, what really riles them up? You know, it's like these little hints of like emotion or flashes of pain. You know, in some cases. And then, like when I find it, it's like, oh, let's let's talk about that. You know, throw away the notes. That you know, the notes were just to get us to this meeting, uh, to this conversation. I, I want to hear about why you cringed or why you grimaced or why you smiled like what was what was behind that so for me it feels very vulnerable it feels very vulnerable uh, to go through this okay guys this is a fantastic conversation um uh, i really enjoy this hopefully our listeners will too as as our tradition let's do a quick round of carve outs again what's been top of mind uh what we've been thinking about let's hear it 
Samir, what we what I've been thinking oh. about is how. Oh, there you go. <laughs> go Sorry, I was it. saying uh, sleep. Ah. I need more <clears throat> sleep. Um, it's top of mind. I think. By the way, I uh, you mentioned Bezos, and this came to mind because I watched one of his interviews where he said, or maybe you mentioned it. Like he gets a lot of sleep, and it's because you know he gets paid to make just like a few good decisions a yep. year. Um, but you mentioned Bezos. I'm out of sleep. That's why I connected the two dots. Top of mind for me this this week is I need more sleep. I think everyone should get more sleep. Um, a durable problem. Yeah. So this is, this a durable is a, problem. This is, yeah, that's for right. sure. Uh, right. Insatiable, if you'll. Yeah, that's right. Avi, Ahmad, let's hear some. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the, the East Coast versus the West Coast. For the past couple mm. of months, I've spent uh, time on the East Coast and I grew up here. And I've loved it. It's it's I forgot how much how many things I liked, like rain. Um, it's nice to see again um, after many years in LA. Um, but I'm also missing parts of California. So it's funny how uh, I don't know. It's, it's funny how different they are, um, and each has some charm to it that I think I've forgotten about. Awesome, AI. I've been thinking a lot about. So I've been reading a lot of. Uh, older philosophy these days. I know DZ, you'd really appreciate this as a, as you know, the chief philosopher on totally, earth. Totally. Totally. Um, and it, it, something that has been coming to mind is like, why is there not more, you know, why, why, are, I guess maybe there, there is like, I guess I'm just discovering it, but like, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, philosophy that's very applicable to today. Um, and you know, like these things that were written like thousands of years ago are still super relevant to like a good way to like even PM, right? Like there's like things that I'm reading on like how to deal with like roadblocks or obstacles that like, and like, you know, strategies for how to live your life when you deal with them. Like, I think that's super relevant. So anyway, that's been top of mind. It's, it's been what I've been, it's we, what I've been We should dig into this in the on. pod. You know, there's, there's lots of philosophical, actually the older the philosophy, the longer it's endured, usually the use more useful it is. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great topic for us. Uh, okay. Just to wrap it up for us this week. Um, hey, what me, about you? What's, yeah, yeah what's you didn't yours? go. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, you know, I look last week we covered other, you know, very different top, very different ideas in my head. But this week, um, you know, mostly I've been thinking about how delightful this pod has become for me personally. I think for you guys too, by the way. I, I think you guys enjoyed it. So, like, there's something a little bit magical about getting together, having this space, talking things out. Like, I, I think we really talk through ideas um, and we build on these ideas. It's not just like a point counterpoint, it's like almost like a, um a thing where we riff on each other so anyway i I just been contemplating how lucky i feel that we get to do this and how delightful you guys are so plus plus one it's on ending us off (laughs) it's pod number Uh, three pod number three (laughs) pod number three he's tearing up all right everyone okay guys (laughs) see you next week all right see you next week thank you Bye. bye